Plants pollen and spore examination is another aspect of trace evidence where we can use plants or pollen or spores to help solve a crime. So forensic paleontology is a specialized field that studies pollen and spore evidence. Since both pollen and spores have resistant structures, they at times can help determine such things as whether a body was moved, a crime's location, whether it occurred in a city or in the country, or in which season it may have occurred. So plants, pollen, and spores are very valuable evidence to us if we can put in the legwork to help. So forensic paleontologists know that each pollen producing plant provides what we call a pollen fingerprint. And this is a specific type of pollen grain. They also know there will be a certain number of grains found in a specific geographic area during a particular time of year. So pollen fingerprints do not remain constant over time. The pollen fingerprint of a plant in October is going to be different than that plant was in April, for example. So pollen fingerprints are not constant which is why it is helpful to us because by analyzing what is at our crime scene, we might be able to tell when or where something occurred. Now, there are two kind of big categories of plants. We have non-seed plants, which are ferns, mosses, liverworts, and horsetails. Those are gonna be spore producing plants. Meanwhile, we have seed plants, which would be gymnosperms, like cichads, um, ginkgos and conifers like an evergreen and angiosperms which are our flowering plants like roses and those are our pollen producing plants. So a little bit more about each of those. So gymnosperms are our oldest of the seed plants. They were the first to evolve and you are probably most familiar with gymnosperms in terms of the evergreens and those are conifer gymnosperms. They produce their seeds in hard, scaly structures um, known as cones. Now, interestingly, the cones, when you think of a pine cone, is actually the female portion of the plant. Male pine cones are this yellow structure that you can see right there. And pollination occurs when pollen is transferred from these yellow male cones to the female pine cones. Now, when you see a pine cone and it's all closed up, that's because it knows it is not the time of year for pollination. They open up into that shape we're more familiar with when it's time for pollination and they're ready to accept that pollen. This is compared to angiosperms, which is the most recent plant group to evolve and is our flowering plants. Plants in this group produce seeds in an enclosed fruit and these plants are very diverse and include a lot of things that you might not even think of as being flowering plants, like corn, oaks, maples, and even grasses. If your parents let their grass grow long enough, it would eventually flower. And some uh, flowering plants contain both male and female parts, while other flowering plants will only certain flowers will have which. In this diagram, you can see up above the stuff that is labeled the pistil, the stigma, style, and ovary. Those are the female parts of the plant. And the stuff that is labeled the uh, stamen, the anther, and the filament are the male parts of this plant. So this plant contains both male and female parts. Now the main focus of these notes is gonna be on pollen because that is the more difficult thing to analyze, but sometimes we do just find plants. So plant matter, such as leaves or stems, may be found at crime scenes. We might find a body that has some leaves on it or some stems on it or some tree bark on it, something from a plant. Now this is relatively easy to analyze because we can just use that plant matter to determine which plant the matter came from. Every plant, that has leaves, for example, those leaves are a different size, shape, color, texture, all of those things. So we can analyze that leaf and figure out what type of plant must have produced it. Based on this, an analysis of that material uh, could lead to um, plant potential plant locations and therefore maybe a location for the crime. Additionally, plant matter can be analyzed for DNA. Plants, just like humans, do have DNA, so we could determine where that specific plant is. Now, going back to pollination, there are two types of pollination. 
And keep in mind, pollination as a vocab word is the transfer of pollen from the male part of the plant to the female part of the plant. Self-pollination um, in flowering plants involves the transfer of pollen from an anther to the stigma within the same flower. This occurs in pea plants, which is why if you remember back to biology, Mendel used pea plants so much because they do self-pollinate. Now this is not actually a great strategy because it involves less DNA being able to be mixed, which is why most plants cross-pollinate, which you can see in the illustration above, and that involves two distinct plants. So the pollen from one plant will go to the female part of a different plant and so forth. Now the pollen of self-pollinating plants is generally of lower value in forensic studies because it's so rarely encountered. We would have to have a victim that was basically laying on a self-pollinating plant in order to get that pollen on them. Now if that happened, totally cool, and we would be able to analyze it, but in general that's unlikely to happen. Now the cross-pollinating pollen can be carried by wind, animals, or water, and pollen carried by wind may be less effective for determining direct links between individuals and places because of the long distance it can be carried. So animal and water is not going to be carried as far, so it's going to be a better value, but wind-pollinated pollen could go over miles, so it's not going to help us as much. Now there are also, as I mentioned before, spore producers. Now spores are similar to pollen, but not quite the same. Spore producers include certain protists like algae, plants, fungi, and bacteria that produce a unique type of spore. For example, and we'll talk more about this in our toxicology unit, bacterial spores or endospores can cause diseases like anthrax and botulism. So spores are not necessarily safe. Um, pollen typically just causes some of us allergic reactions, but spores can actually be pretty deadly. Spore analysis has the advantage um, in that spores can be grown in the species um, identified with certainty. If we have pollen, we're never going to be able to grow a plant just from that pollen alone. So we're going to have to analyze the pollen just as it is. Spores, on the other hand, can produce a whole structure with just the spore. So we can grow that spore in our lab to be able to figure out what algae, what fungi, what bacteria it's going to produce and identify it with greater accuracy. Now, spore dispersal is a little bit different than um, pollen dispersal, but not much. Um, algae typically disperses spores into the water or the air. And you can see this mushroom here it keeps its spores on the underside of its cap, and it's going to drop them underneath it. In general, spore producers have the same value in investigations as pollen from wind-pollinated plants, in that typically spores can also travel a very great distance. So we're likely not going to be able to pinpoint a location they came from. Now when it comes to pollen and spore identification in solving crimes, you can see I have a, and you will not be able to get pictures this good in class, these are very high powered microscopes, but you can see I have two different types of pollen pictures. One is from an angiosperm, one is from a gymnosperm, and they look very different. And this is why different plants can only pollinate their same type of plant because they know that it's not the right type of pollen based on how it looks and feels, essentially. So that outer shell of a pollen grain and spore is called the exide, and it has a complex and unique structure. You can see that the angiosperms kind of looks like oatmeal, Meanwhile, the gymnosperm looks like some sort of spiky fidget toy. And these are revealed under a microscope. And we can identify what plant it came from based on this unique appearance, which could be important trace evidence in solving crimes. Now, when it comes to finding pollen and spores, there are a lot of places we could look. Could be in living or decaying plant material, soil, dirt, mud, dust, Hair, fur, feathers, I guarantee you your dog is constantly covered in pollen. Pollen loves to get in clothing and shoes and blankets and rugs and baskets and carpets. It could get in the victim's skin, hair, nails, nasal passages when they breathe in, lungs, stomach, intestines, and fecal matter. We're also all eating a decent amount of pollen, whether we want to think about it or not. Paper, money, packaging material, vehicles, furniture, air filters, and cars are full of pollen. Cracks and crevices in floors, walls, roofs, and fences, drug resins, and sometimes we eat pollen on purpose and like honey and some other foods. 
So this list is all to sort of show you that pollen spores are everywhere. So that's what makes them difficult for forensic investigation because you have a hard time telling what is just there versus what relates to your crime. But if we believe that we do have valuable pollen or spore evidence, here's how we collect it. So during an investigation, control samples must be collected as well as evidence samples. A control sample is sort of our baseline. So we're saying at this crime scene right now, this is the pollen and spores that are just there in the air existing. That way we can compare it to see if there's anything different about our, uh, the body or whatever it is we're investigating versus the control. Samples must be collected wearing gloves with clean tools such as brushes or cellophane tape and placed in sterile containers, which then must be sealed and labeled with care. Sampling instruments must be cleaned after each use or new ones must be used. We don't want to cross-contaminate from one crime scene to another. Collected evidence must be secured and the chain of custody must be maintained. Now, when it comes to analyzing that pollen and spore evidence, to identify pollen and spores, specialists can use a compound light microscope, a scanning electron microscope, like we saw with the hair evidence, and reference collections that may consist of photos and illustrations, or perhaps even actual dried specimens arranged systematically, which we call those herbariums. So by getting a detailed look at our grain, we're gonna be able to compare it to all of the pollen and spore evidence we know to exist in order to make a match. Pollen and spore evidence that has been collected, analyzed, and interpreted can be presented in court. It meets the Daubert criteria. And these fingerprints can be used to determine certain aspects of the crime. Now, is pollen or spores likely to be your slam dunk piece of evidence? Probably not, but it is still used to solve crimes and does have some import to it.